Welcome everyone, this is Slow Food Live. My name is Michelle and I'm a communications intern at Slow Food USA. Slow Food Live is a project of Slow Food USA. And if you're not familiar with Slow Food USA, I encourage you to jump on our website, which is slowfoodusa.org to learn more about who we are and what we do. At a high level, we are an international nonprofit that advocates and works towards good, clean and fair food for all. This spans throughout many sectors. So on Slow Food Live, over the last year or so, we have been leaning into different topic areas and bringing wonderful people on from various communities to share what they do. Today, I am so excited to introduce our panel from Black Farmer Fund. Black Farmer Fund is an emergencies community investment fund and 501c3 that invests in Black food systems entrepreneurs in New York State. As part of their investment process, they emphasize financial education, collective governance and decision-making, and supporting the whole individual and whole community towards community wealth building and a sustainable future. Our moderator for today is the Black Farmer Fund board member, Onika Abraham, who uses she, her pronouns. Onika is the executive director of Farm School NYC. She is a parent, a partner, a farmer, and an educator with more than 15 years of experience as a senior nonprofit manager. Olivia Watkins, who uses she, her pronouns, is the co-founder and president of Black Farmer Fund. She is a social entrepreneur and impact investor. For the past seven years, she has financed, developed, and operated environmental and social projects across the US. She also serves as a board member for Soul Fire Farm Institute. And lastly, we have Melanie Allen, who uses she, her pronouns, and is the program director of Black Farmer Fund. Melanie is passionate about pushing forward efforts that create a future where Black farmers and residents take control of local food systems and have access to healthy, affordable, and sustainable food. Melanie has worked on the intersection of climate change, agriculture, human rights, and international policy for nearly a decade. Just to go over a quick housekeeping item, if you have any questions at all throughout the webinar, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will collect them and answer them at the end of the panel. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, Anika. Hello, thank you so much, Michelle, for that lovely introduction. It is a pleasure to be here today and to be reminded of this illustrious panel that I'm part of and to hear the bios of two women who I'm so inspired by, um, Melanie and Olive. Olivia, we were taught to say <laughs> at the beginning of this, uh, let's be formal here. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with y'all today. So to start off, we really just wanted to hear like how we got here. How did we get here today? What drew you to this work of regional food system building? Um, Centering Black folks. And um, yeah, Olive, do you want to start? Yeah, I can definitely start. So um, in terms of how the organization even started, it was around conversations of lack of access to capital for Black farmers. And um, our other board member, Karen and myself, we had this conversation at a farmer conference. And this was around the time that I was farming full time on different farms and I was transitioning into um, a land stewardship role with my family's land um, that has been in our family for several generations. And I was really, really excited about the role and also realized that there were a lot of disparities that black farmers face and families might like my family had faced that put us in certain positions where we are today, where we are either denied from um, financial institutions or unable to access capital from friends and family, not only because of historical discrimination, but also the racial wealth gap. And so we can see it you know, across the, uh, across the states, but especially in New York, black farmers have a total cash income of negative $900 while white farmers have 42,000. So as I was like getting into the state and seeing some of these statistics, I knew that I wanted to be a part of something that was like working actively to create change. And so that's, that's how I got involved in um, Black Farmer Fund. Um, I'll pass it to Mel. What about you? How what brought you to this work? I mean, Melanie. <laughs> Thanks, Olive. And and for me, it's it's quite similar. This work is very very personal. Um, I'm from New York, currently residing on Wenatchee land, aka Brooklyn, and my family is from Jamaica. 
And both my grandparents grew up in the countryside, growing up close to the land. And although they went to the city for high school and spent most of their adulthood in a in an urban setting, working more traditional jobs, um, farming and being in a relationship with the environment and the land was always something meaningful for both of them. And, and it still is now well into their 90s. And I spent my childhood spending time in Jamaica with them. So this was also instilled in me from a really young age. And as a kid, I was always playing with insects and curious about, about natural ecosystems. And, and these earlier experiences still inform where I am today. I studied agriculture and natural resource management for, for undergrad and grad school and have worked on different issues connected to water quality, climate adaptation, policy, agriculture in both an international and national setting. And, and what I really realized from these experiences was that regardless of what environmental issue I was working on, there are clear disparities around who had access to finance, resources, decision-making, and an inequitable power dynamic systemically left our marginalized communities out of these spaces. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really what brought me to Black Farmer Fund. I wanted to work in a space that was directly focused on shifting power, shifting decision-making, and redistributing resources to groups that have been historically left out of these spaces. And I wanted to do this in an agricultural context. And I also wanted to do this on a more regional, localized level, closer to home. Um, and I'd love to throw it back to you, Anika, and, and hear what brought you to focusing on running a farmer training program in, in New York City, where you grew up. <sighs> It's funny to think about how um, early in your careers you came to this work. Um, this is definitely a second career choice for me, maybe even third, depending on how we're counting. But it does harken back, um, similar to similar to what both of you have said, to family, to like ancestral knowledge and that draw to agriculture. Uh, my grandmother grew up on a well, my mother grew up on a farm, and her mother uh, grew almost everything that they ate. Um, on that farm in Alabama, which I'm on my way to in just a week. I can't wait to be there. Um, and so I, that was part of my legacy, it was part of my upbringing, but I really didn't come to farming until after getting burnt out in the nonprofit world. Uh, I know that's kind of ironic because I'm now an executive director, but I got, <laughs> non, I got burnt out in a different type of nonprofit. Wanted to come back to my growing roots and went to a farmer training program that was really um, radically different and life-changing for me and also woefully inadequate in so many ways. And so going through that process where it was a, a more um, traditional kind of su sustainable agricultural kind of experience, wanting an experience that um, I didn't have to actually like leave my job um, and uproot my life um, and, and live without a salary for a full year and a half. All those things are systemic issues that keep black and brown people and low income people from doing experiences like that. We wanted to create something that was different and more accessible for farmers of color like myself. And also just like uplisted all of our like experience that we're talking about that came down to us through our parents or could have if that wasn't interrupted um, and really centered that experience as experts. And that's what farm school ends up being. Um, we're an adult education program um, located here in New York City. Um, and all that we do is centering black and brown folks within the space, uh, low income folks, um, teaching and sharing sharing knowledge around growing in, um, in urban spaces and looking at regenerative agriculture in, in particular and linking that back to our ancestral legacies. Um, so that is uh, my joy. I love doing it. Um, and I really think it's, it's interesting for us as well, and especially sitting in my role as a board member of Black Farmer Fund, of thinking about this larger context of Black people and growing in New York State. Um, we really focus on an urban um, spectrum here in New York uh, with Farm School NYC. Um, and I think it makes sense because like 97% of Black people in New York State actually live in New York City um, and the majority in other cities as well. So that urban world continuum is so important in the work that we do. And I'm curious to hear from Black Farmer Fund's perspective, what, how is the work of Black Farmer Fund strengthening this urban rural continuum? And I think I'm gonna give this to Mel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, as, a, as an investment fund that, that really centers racial justice and, and non-extractive capital and, and building financial education in a holistic way, 
it's really important to recognize that farmers and food actors don't exist in isolation and they're across the state. So in addition to looking at providing forms of capital that, that really are informed by the previous historical discrimination that Black folks have experienced in more traditional banking and lending vehicles, what really makes BFF different from other funds is this community governance piece. Um, our investment theory, which, which guides the decision making and the overall governance of the fund is done by a committee of Black food actors that come from different parts of New York State, but also they hold different roles in the food system. And we call this, this group our pilot community because we are currently in our pilot phase. And it's so crucial for us for the decision making to be informed by, by these lived experiences that have a more full understanding of the, real, the reality that, that these businesses and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are really facing. And for us, the concept of community wealth building is really integral to our model and thinking of bridging the gap between urban and rural food actors and when we're thinking of strengthening these relationships. So for, for us, community wealth building is really an approach to economic development in a movement way that, that strengthens communities through broader democratic ownership and, and localizing investment in the community and in real deep collaboration, partnership and coordination with others towards a, a larger collective benefit, a greater good. So for us, we're really building community wealth through this collective investment in our ecosystem and recognizing that these different actors across the state need to be in collaboration and partnership with each other to be stronger. And the businesses that receive funding from, from Black Farmer Fund don't just receive funding based on their, their individual role or contribution as a business, but for the potential or the existing relationships between them and through considering how they might work together to sustain and build a stronger supply chain. And Onika, I'm curious to, to hear how an organization like BFF that has recently entered this space in terms of contributing to a regional food system could benefit from, from farm schools efforts to support farmers that are accessing opportunities in more rural areas of New York. Capital is always the, uh, the, one of the biggest barriers when it comes to um, entering into agriculture in New York State. Um, this is one of the most expensive places um, to live. Um, farmland is at a premium. We don't have that much of it to begin with in comparison to some other states. Um, and uh, actually owning it is radically expensive. Um, the infrastructure it takes to start a farm is so expensive. So um, for sure, um, there's so many ways that Black Farmer Fund benefits the graduates of farm school and the folks that are in farm school to kind of realize these dreams that they're having and um, hopefully um, really creating um, and adding to that ecosystem and the community wealth building that we're trying to provide. So um, BFF entering into the space has been an incredible boon for our, our students and our, and our community in general. Um, I hope vice versa as well. I'm thinking as well as, um, as um, newer um, entries are, are coming in. Um, I think there are some, hopefully we'll see, but some folks that are applying for funding with Black Farmer Fund who might want to brush up on certain skill areas or enter into more urban agriculture or diversify in some way their businesses that might involve some of the, um, the lessons and courses and work that we do here in farm school. Um, we have 20 different courses that we're offering. And so I'm, I'm really curious to see how in, ter in terms of like technical assistance, we might collaborate more as we're moving forward. Um, and just speaking about like all of the different businesses that are applying um, for Black Farmer Fund, um, I as a board member have been like overwhelmed and so excited about the amount of um, people who've been applying and the diversity of them. So I'm wondering like, can you talk a little bit more about how BFF is selecting which businesses are moving forward with funding? Olive, please. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely take that one. Yeah, I would agree. It's definitely been really um, positively overwhelming, like seeing all the different varieties of businesses that fall within the food system and their like already interconnectedness with one another or people who are still, who are just starting and, and who are looking to get plugged in. Um, and so, for us, we um, basically developed our investment criteria um, based off of three different pillars. So we were looking to see that businesses were interested in participating in community wealth building through their business activities. 
that they were having a positive ecological impact um, with their business activities and the way that they were mitigating waste. Um, and also that they had an economic justice component. So they realized that, you know, they are not just this individual who siloed, you know, in, in their struggles to um, obtain capital, that there's a systemic issue at play and they're aware of it and they want to gather with other people in order to figure out how to change that. Or they have services or goods that are specifically geared towards providing um, providing access to um, goods and services for communities that have been marginalized. So like, for instance, you know, our farmers, right? We have a lot of farmers that we will be working with that um, are serving um, at farmers markets in communities of color um, or are serving their local churches um, or are prioritizing serving people who are low income. Um, and so, you know, we really want to be able to invest in those types of businesses. Um, so it's been a really great process as well. We have a, an amazing committee that we call our pilot community that's made up of 12 different um, Black farmers and food businesses across New York State. And they basically have come together to make the decisions on um, investment allocation. Um, and so as we're kind of going into this round of funding and just in general for a Black Farmer Fund, we really, it's important for us to be able to deploy capital that's that's integrated capital, that's patient and that's reparative. So integrated meaning being able to provide different flexible types of capital. So right now um, we, you know, we're prioritizing giving farmers and food businesses loans and grants. Patient meaning very flexible terms, on grants, uh, on loans, especially, and reparative, meaning that you know it's not just about finance. There are also all these other different types of capital that we can support our food businesses with in order to repair um, the Black food system and also close the uh, racial wealth gap and disparities that we're seeing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I have a question for you, Onika. Does Farm School have you know certain criteria around? Uh, people who participate in your programs in a way that kind of embeds the continuum of building out a regional food system? No, not at all. It's basically first come, first serve. No, I'm joking. It's not basically first come, first serve. Um, we have a lot of criteria um, that we consider. Um, but the the two biggest things for us when it when we're talking about who's applying to farm school and wants to get into a certificate program, which as I said, it's a two-year program. It's a big commitment, time commitment that people are making and setting out in their lives. Um, and it's pretty competitive, mostly because we're a small organization. So we have to turn away about 75% of the people who apply just because we only can really successfully um, hold a cohort of maybe 25 to 30 students every year. Um, the biggest things that we're looking for are folks that are looking to grow um, with an eye towards sovereignty, well, like an eye towards um, food justice and reparative action, positive action within a particular community that they, that they define. So if you're coming to farm school, learning, wanting to learn how to grow tomatoes, that's wonderful. We teach that trellising all of that great um, but that is if that's all that you want to do with it is to go out and grow tomatoes in your backyard we don't have a place for you in our school only because we are really looking for folks that are looking to make a change in the communities that they're serving um, and are connected to those communities so we, that's something that we're looking for as a through line throughout all of our applications for sure. Um, and the sense that they want to like share that knowledge to pass that along. We are an education organization and we um, believe in spreading that gift by bringing people in who also want to, to share. Um, so they don't have to be teachers per se, but like they have to really understand and define a community that they want to, to share knowledge with. That's an important part of it as well. Yeah. Um, other than that, we're really open because we're hopeful, just similar to Black Farmer Fund. Like we know that creating this ecosystem and making a change you wanna see takes people at all levels and acting in all different realms of the ecosystem, of the food system to make this change. Like we need, um, you know, I wanna say 
I was trying to go back to my MBA world of like, you know, vertical integration. Is that the one that I want to use? Yeah, um, yeah, vertical integration, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. So we, we want to integrate across um, all of these different modes of distribution in different channels so that we're really making this kind of united difference. And that that's really important within the ecosystem of farm school, within the ecosystems that we're working in the Black Farmer Fund, and just like more largely, I think, as well. And so, um, so those are some of the criteria that we think about. And that's we're thinking about it a lot right now because we're about to open applications in August and like that. Mm -hmm exciting and also yeah. overwhelming. And I will be asking both of y'all to help us read applications. So be aware, it's coming. Um, okay, so we have uh, talked about um, so much about funding. Um, we've talked touched about uh, touched on the whole idea of shifting decision-making power. And I wanna really underscore that. Um, for me, this is such a critical part of what makes Black Farmer Fund really different from a lot of what are so, so called, I'm gonna say, which sounds a little harsh, but community, community investment funds. Um, sometimes they, they're thinking about serving a particular community, but the people who are making those decisions are actually not of that community. And that is like Black Farmer Fund has totally turned that on its head. That's a really big important different point of differentiation for us. Um, but what else needs to happen? for the success of this black food ecosystem that we're, we're building here, um, other than funding, um, what else is, is needed? Yeah, so much, <laughs> always. Um, but I think, you know, for us, we knew that, um, you know, it was important for our organization, not only one, to collaborate with other black food organizations and, you know, nationally and even regionally, um, and be involved in whatever work that they're doing. Um, because yeah, for that's one. And two, we knew that we couldn't just give people uh, financing without any sort of support with, for networking build, network building, uh, market opportunities um, through that network building, and then also technical assistance on um, ways that people could leverage that financing for either more financing from other institutions or um, to be able to um, secure different types of equipment. Um, we wanted to give people like everything that they that they needed financially. So that way it wouldn't just be like, here's a check, see you later in, you know, next quarter when you send us, you know, your financials so we can see how you're doing. We really wanted it, you know, when we say community wealth building, it, it really is and uh, you know an accountability um, to one another. Um, and so we knew that you know by making an agreement to to go forward with supporting a farmer food business with financing that we were holding each other accountable in the process for that business to be able to partake in building community wealth. And it looks completely different from for every single organization. Um, you know, like when you're thinking about farmers um, who have thin profit margins, but they can prioritize what markets they are going into in order to eradicate some of the food apartheid that we see in communities of color. For some of the more value added businesses that have higher profit margins, you know, they can either give percentages of their, of their revenue to other organizations, um, or they can hire people who come from um, come from their community and surrounding communities. And so, you know, that's, you know, that's a pretty big, big lift to, in order for, you know, a business to be able to like go outside of, you know, the, the box and be able to um, be able to create a new system by the decisions that the daily business decisions that they make. And so we wanted to make sure that we were providing people with technical assistance and like mentorship, someone to be able to talk with them about how to actually operationalize some of these values. Um, and then also through network building, we're a part of many different organizations. So one organization that Farm School and, or it's not really an organization at this point in time, but it's a coalition, um, I would say uh, that Farm School and, and Black Farmer Fund are a part of is um, what we call the ecosystem. And it's five different BIPOC-led organizations in the food system of New York. Um, that focus on different areas of the food system. So as Onika was talking, Farm School NYC focuses on training, 
Um, another member of the eco ecosystem, Soul Fire Farm, also focuses on training and they're located in more rural areas. Um, and then we have Corbin Hill Food Project that is a food distribution company. I think Dennis is on here. Hi, Dennis. Um, and then we also have um, Northeast Farms of Color Land Trust. I think I saw Gabby on here as well, um, but um, they help to provide access to um, land um, and also technical assistance. So there's, there's lots of overlaps um, amongst the different organizations in terms of trying to help to support um, businesses, um, whether or not it's through technical assistance, accessing land, accessing financing, accessing education, like all of the things that a farmer needs in order to be supported or a food business needs in order to be supported, we realized that we had to come together um, in order to achieve that and not one organization can be you know, the, the end all be all and the, and the one stop shop. Um, so that's one major um, coalition that's that's very near and dear to us. And then and another um, budding organization, Black Farmers United, New York State. And so that is our like policy advocacy um, organization that is um, really focused on making sure that um, in the state of New York, um, black farmers and food businesses are being prioritized either through legislation or through um, budgets. Um, and, you know, we really feel like it's important as yes, we are working, you know, with, uh, with the different organizations to be able to support one another, but ultimately to their, <laughs> the state government is also just as responsible for supporting um, the farmers in, in its state um, and, and making sure that farmers and food businesses are being able to participate in the $42 billion ag industry that's, that's in New York State. Um, anything else, Mel, that you want to, that you want to mention that I forgot? I'll just um, uplift the, the relationship building piece and how key that was to the application process for not only the BFF team in the pilot community, but for the businesses that are receiving funding we're really excited to, to build out our financial education support outside of the one-on-one -on -one business coach they'll be working with. So we'll be having monthly meetings with all the businesses that are receiving funding for them to learn from each other, for them to you know, be able to exchange and build relationships amongst each other as well. And we're really excited that this summer we're gonna get to visit all of the businesses and the businesses will be visiting each other. So when we're thinking about building out this network, there are so many different layers to it. So we have the ecosystem layer, we have our coalition, but then we also have the larger BFF community that is bringing together our pilot community members, our, our businesses receiving funding in a, in a space where they can really uplift and, and exchange on the, the expertises and wisdom that they hold. Um, yeah. Thanks for adding that. Yeah, that's a really crucial piece. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. I am I'm noticing one, uh, I didn't even look at the participant tab. Hello, family. There's a lot of family out there in the participant tab. A lot of questions coming in the chat as well. So I do want to um, leave uh, plenty of time to start to answer those. Um, but before we go into that, um, just speaking about those relationships and um, and the different layers of them, Mel, uh, I love this idea because I, what I also know is that even those folks that were not able to receive funding this round are still considered part of this, um, part of our community and folks that we're building a relationship with and are invited to some of the supplemental activities and things that we're doing and courses and things like that, which is so dynamite. Um, so now I wanted like explore even more, like who was in that pool, what was going on, who applied, uh, just give us a sense of, of what that larger community looks like of people who were applying for funding from Black Pharma Fund this round. Yeah, yeah, of course. We were super excited to, I mean, we weren't that surprised because we know the need in our community is huge, but we received over 50 applications for the pilot phase, which was overwhelming in some ways. But, but it was really just so compelling and really just reflective of the state of Black food actors in New York State. 40% um, of the applications came from, from folks that identified as farmers or growers, some new, some that have been farming for, for generations, for, for 30 years and plus. Um, we had some applications from apothecaries that do different types of work to, to ensure that BIPOC folks have access to, to to medicine and other types of healing, healing tools. Um, 
We also got applications from, from caterers and restaurants, uh, a few farming groups and value added product groups that have more of a cooperative collective governance model. And, and throughout the application process, it was really clear that the needs of the entrepreneurs were shifting as a result of COVID. So we saw that a few of the businesses had to pivot in response to, to market shifts and closures and their need for, for grant capital uh, had increased. So, so a lot of folks are looking for, for funding support for different, different purposes, whether it was buying land, buying new equipment, paying off debt, being able to pivot to, to have a catering service that did more home delivery because having a restaurant space was no longer an option. So um, it was a really, it was really difficult for the pilot community to narrow down these applications. And there was a series of different types of relationship building spaces for them to get a better idea of what these businesses were doing, how they were in alignment with the, the investment guidelines of BFF and how they fit into this, this larger ecosystem, this larger network. Thank you so much, Mel. I'm really hopeful that we can um, see more successful folks being funded out of that group as we're kind of growing our relationship with them. That would be really amazing. Um, we are going so fast. So moment of transparency, audience. We've done a lot of preparation for this and I've thought of some questions in advance and we're just like flying through them. Um, so now I wanna throw a question to y'all that we didn't talk about. Um, and that is, what has been the biggest challenge so far in, in this, in this um, launching this fund? Um, and each of you can answer that in whichever way, however deeply you feel you, you can <laughs> in this very public forum. But yeah, let's talk about challenges a bit. Yes, I, I love that question um, because, yeah, while we have been really blessed to have a lot of success in um, you know, the first few years of being an organization. Um, we, I think the biggest challenge was that um, we were in the first um, stages of receiving funding and increasing our staffing capacity when the uprisings happened last June around the murders of George Floyd and Maud Aubrey and others. And um, as a result, there was just this like inflow of inquiries, donations, um, requests for support, offerings for support. And it was basically just Melanie and myself. And it was Melanie's maybe like first or, first or second month in the organization. And so um, for us in that moment, you know, we, we had to essentially like create systems as they were being used um, rather than like creating the system, maybe like testing it out on a smaller scale and then implementing it. Um, and so I think that in itself was something that was amazing, but also completely unexpected in terms of, um, you know, what, our, what we believed our trajectory to be. Um, so I think that was definitely a very challenging um, moment in the way that like, you know, there was so much information coming into us that we um, were feeling pulled to, to react and respond to so many things that were like very real and present. Um, and at the same time, you know, we try to be intentional about the fact that we are an organization that is looking to create um, systemic change rather than like an emergency response organization. And so there was constantly for me personally, you know, there were so many inquiries and like very, very urgent and present things happening in that moment um, that would have completely diverted, you know, our, the way that we do work, you know, a year later. Um, and so having that focus and having that intentionality and like saying no to certain things um, in order to, you know, achieve this goal of being able to have um, an organization that was focused on like long-term patient um, capital um, and also systemic change was, um, it was very hard in that moment to be able to like do that, especially because we were so, so, so new. What about you, Mel? What do you, what would you say? Echoing everything you say, that was definitely a, a challenging time. And I think something more, more connected to the pilot fund in terms of a challenge was 
just the demand that we have from farmers and food businesses across the state for funding, um, especially during the pandemic, people, people are needing funds at a more urgent rate and balancing being intentional about relationship building for more long-term funding while making sure that people get what they need to survive in the moment was definitely a challenge. Um, you know, we had a goal of having a $1 million pilot fund and we could have given all 50 applications a check for a smaller amount if we wanted to do that. But we, we decided to be really conscious about how many businesses we could actually like hold and like carry through that process. So it wouldn't be giving folks a, a check that would just, you know, go towards paying off debt, but like really actually supporting them with thinking through their business model, thinking through their business plan and being able to provide technical support outside of business development. So, so their relationship with the business coach that they'll be working with, uh, Johan Matthews, who's great, he, um, he's really gonna be identifying what gaps outside of funding do folks have? Is it legal support? Is it marketing and agribusiness support? And we're gonna also be thinking through how we can provide consultant support or in-house mentorship through our networks to really try to fill the gaps outside of funding because there are all these different barriers that really keep black food actors from being successful. And we just wouldn't have the capacity as a small team to do that for all 50 applications. So that was definitely a, a challenge for us to be really re realistic and intentional about how many businesses we are able to hold. And even 10, we've talked to other funds that are like for a pilot phase, like three or four is like a lot. So <laughs> We're, we're definitely being really ambitious. Um, for, I remember for that meeting and, when yeah. we tried to narrow it down and it was yeah. just, the pilot community just couldn't do it. And the, 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 the need was so great and the organizations that uh, were applying for funding were so dynamite and they all felt so important to this ecosystem that we're trying to build. Um, yeah, it was hard. Um, and like thanking staff um, for taking on TIN, um, it's true, like that is irregular. <laughs> it's very ambitious, especially since some of these other funds that do one at a time probably have like larger staffs too right now. Yeah, Hans is here. Hans is one of our pilot community members. And he, if Hans, if you wanna share anything in the chat about that experience, but. I know, yeah, Melanie, um, Lex, one of our other um, colleagues who's our community wealth facilitator, um, we went into the pilot community meeting like, okay, we're only going to work with seven or eight. <laughs> and we're like, yes, okay, seven or eight. And then we got into the meeting and then we broke down. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're like, okay, well, maybe nine. Okay, yeah. five, 10. <laughs> Let me see what happened. Yeah. Um, well, great. And at, at some time soon, this is a, this is a process that, that's happening right now, but um, when do you think that um, Black Farmer Fund will really just kind of like announce more publicly who these organizations are that are being supported this round? Yeah, we're still working through some of the terms and working through um, just making sure that we can set up the farmers well before actually deploying the funds to them. Um, so kind of once all of those details are um, in order, we will be doing that. And we, we're hoping to be able to do that over this summer, already summer, but over the next few months, we're hoping to do that. Okay. So yeah, definitely follow our newsletter. We will be making announcements. Okay, great. Um, I'm still um, have to keep checking myself about what I can say publicly or not, um, but excited for that public announcement. Um, so we're, uh, we have so many questions in the chat. Michelle has graciously um, um, decided or um, offered to monitor the chat and to feed us some questions. I definitely want to save um, a question at the end for our Pharma Fund um, folks to just um, talk about how we as a group on this webinar can support the organization. Um, but until then, Michelle, if you could just give us a minute or two uh, for that at the end. But yeah, what what should we address? Yes, hi, thank you so much for such an amazing conversation. Um, the chat has been lighting up, so we probably won't get to all questions, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so the first question we have for you is, how can people that are not immersed in farming get involved? 
and any of you can take it. <laughs> Onika, I think that's for you. Yeah. Um, is it? I mean, it's never too late to get involved with, you know, rebuilding a relationship with, with the environment, with the land. But, but I think Farm School in New York City provides a lot of opportunities for that initial uh, experience, even though it is very clear that Farm School in New York City is also for folks that have a larger vision of transitioning into more of a full-time farming role. But, but Onika, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, sure. So um, yes, I mean, certainly if, if folks are interested um, in learning to farm, um, there are some kind of like low, lower, um, lower investment kind of time investment things that we offer in public programming that can be really interesting for folks um, and hoping to do more of that as we're moving further along in this year and next. Um, and then, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that if you eat food, you are part of the ecosystem, you are part of the food system, you're a, a critical part of the food system and you, the choices you make really matter. So I think that there's a lot to be said for, um, for just being an informed and activist eater um, and really um, looking into ways that you can um, connect more to the people who are growing your food, um, to fight for those, the rights of the people for, um, growing your food, um, and as much as you can to be closer to them, you know, so if that looks like a farmer's market or a CSA or a food share, there are a number of organizations that, um, you know, do that kind of work and, and linking folks up um, who are eaters in that way. I think that's critically important. I think never discount um, the power that you have as an eater and as a voter <laughs> um, as well, um, you know, to be able to weigh in on the policies that are impacting farmers and farm workers and the people who work in the system is, is really, really important. So again, um, activist eaters, um, unite, <laughs> um, support, sign up for these newsletters from Black Farmer Fund and Farm School NYC and Black Farmers United um, to know more about how you can um, flex the power that you really do have. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so we've gotten a few questions from people outside of New York State, um, such as Tennessee and Georgia. And they're wondering if any of you um, have any experience or advice for getting access to capital in those states. And as a related question, someone was wondering if, BF if BFF is thinking about expanding to other areas of the country. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in terms of accessing capital outside of New York State, we really look to um, National Black Food and Justice Alliance they move a lot of resources and a lot of money nationally for Black farmers. Um, and so, um, yes, that is, that is the place that we would definitely um, encourage you to reach out to um, and become a member as well of the organization. We're also members of MBFJA. Um, and then in terms of being outside of New York, we get this question a lot. Um, there are so many really great organizations that are either focused on uh, racial justice or racial justice through a food lens that you know, we are connected with and having conversations with about being able to um, collectively unite forces to increase our capacity. Um, but at this point in time, BF, BFF is not uh, focused on going outside of New York or even the Northeast, um, but there are so many different organizations across the country that are like in formation right now that we will, you know, continue to lift up as we, you know, go along as well. But for us, you know, and, and the reason why for that is because, especially, you know, going back to the topic of this panel in creating, you know, regional food systems, it's important to make sure, make it, to make sure that the financing is also regional um, and is with intention around like building regional food systems rather than, um, you know, us, in, us investing in a farmer in, in New York, but then a food distributor um, in Arkansas. Like, yeah. And so, you know, our intention, our intention is to be able to like connect food distributors with farmers. And that's harder to do that when people are at completely different opposite sides of the country. And so um, the term for it is called place-based investing. And that is really kind of a large part of um, our framework and, and why we made the decision to stay regional. Great, thank you for all those great resources. 
Um, and now we have a New York specific question. So someone, um, one of the attendees stated that they go to a college that's located in the Bronx and many of the students there are food insecure. So they were asking for some advice around how to get um, that school started in advocacy, growing food, starting a garden, education on food ways, et cetera. Now I really want to know what school. I know. <laughs> that was you who put it in the chat. What school you're at? Curious, like, what you like it? School are we talking about here? But um, yes, that's such a great question. You know, the the first thing that comes to mind is Real Food Challenge. Are y'all familiar with that organization? They do such incredible work. Real Food Challenge. They do a lot of organizing with students, student organized, student led organizing on campus around food, in particular around um, how to um, change the, the purchasing um, uh, policies that your school might have. Oh, okay, I got you. Uh, maybe I won't blow up your school, but I see you in the chat, <laughs> which school it is. <laughs> um, but that is a, a really incredible organization. They have different chapters around, um, around the, the, the nation. Um, I think they're wonderful. Um, so that's one way you can get started just with the organizing aspect. Again, like the people power that happens on a college campus is amazing and should not ever be discounted. The changes that you can make on an organizational basis. Um, so I'd start there. And, you know, I think, again, if you are, are, are interested, please uh, look up Farm School NYC. We'd love to figure out ways that we can connect. And we do a lot of classes around the city where our classes also help create and build out farms and gardens around the city. So um, we love to do projects like, you know, building lots of raised beds or putting up high tunnels or, or doing, you know, waste water systems or irrigation systems. So if there's spaces that you're advocating for on campus that need that kind of infrastructure built, um, that's the kind of things that our, our faculty and students love to get involved in doing. So. There's that. Um, but yeah, Olive and Mel, do you have any thoughts about that as well? I feel like you've summed it up perfectly. Great. Um, the next question um, is asking if you could expand a little bit more on, in addition to funding, how you all plan to help address the internal dynamics attached to affecting food insecurity and Black land ownership in urban communities. I can start and then I'll let's tag team. <laughs> I think I think for BFF, something that we've learned over the past year is there's a lot of needs that our community members have and we can't fill all of them. And that doesn't mean that those needs can't be filled, but I think the, the ecosystem model that we are developing and working through is extremely strong because we're hitting all the different points for a new farmer or old farmer coming from education, having access to land, having access to markets, and then having access to, to, to funding. Having access to markets, land, and funding, sorry. <laughs> so looking at how all these different points on this kind of continuum are connected, I think in itself really just uplifts a racially just food system because we're recognizing that there isn't just one gap that has historically left Black farmers or Black food entrepreneurs from succeeding. It's multiple gaps. It's the, the moment you try to get a, get a lease and you're rejected. It's the moment you try to request a, a loan and somebody says that you have a bad credit score. So I think for BFF specifically, we're really trying to unlearn a lot of the traditional funding vehicle practices and do it in a new way. So thinking through questions like, what does it look like for a lender and a lendee to actually be in good relationship with each other and have the same, the same goals in mind? For, for profit to not be measured in just coins and, and dollars, but for it to actually look at social capital and the impact that this person is having in their community. For repayment terms to be flexible or built around the needs of that farmer. So during the winter months when it would be really difficult for them to actually pay back, they wouldn't be required for them to pay back. So I think something that BFF is doing in a really intentional way is really giving the autonomy to the food entrepreneur to say what they need and for us to find a way to accommodate those needs. We're really committed to not underfunding folks. So, you know, there have been experiences where, you know, a pilot community member might be looking over 
an application and will say, you know, this person's asking for $10,000, but they could actually use $30,000. So also doing that, that kind of coaching to help folks recognize that like, we shouldn't be approaching funding from a mindset of sparsity. We have all that we need. And when we are working together, it's so much stronger. Um, Paul, do you wanna add? That was like a mic drop right there. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, kind of related to this, we had a couple people asking um, for more information about your organizational model and kind of the ecosystem you've been describing. So is there a specific place we can point those folks to for those resources? Yeah, um, we on our, oh, you can go off. Yeah, on our website, we have information about who all is involved. Um, and there's also so many people who are not actually named on our website who are also involved. Um, but in terms of, you know, our, our community governance, our pilot community is um, the, the center of our decision making. And we have those folks all on our website and they all have amazing businesses and nonprofit organizations across New York. Um, and then um, in terms of our board, which we, um, have Onika here present and also Dennis and, and Karen who are also involved in um, different uh, food businesses as well. Um, and then we have Lex who um, couldn't be here today, but she's our community wealth facilitator and she really facilitates the pilot community and even in other places internally around coming to collective decisions. Um, and making sure that there are many voices involved in the process of decision making and also being able to center relationship in our process. Um, but then we have so many other partners as well outside of that that we work with, like the folks in the ecosystem that we mentioned, Black Farmers United that we mentioned. And um, we really value uh, collective listening and, and listening. Um, and so whenever we walk into a decision, um, our partners and our pilot community um, is always with us in that room, even if they're not physically there. Um, and we really take, you know, what our what our community's thoughts are and and the opinions um, that people have shared with us very seriously in in decision making, even if they don't necessarily have a formal role in our organization. Great, thank you for all that. Um, so we have an attendee that was kind of chatting a little bit about how in urban areas, the space to grow your own food is often very limited. Um, and sometimes having access to organic local food becomes more do doable through farmers markets. So they were wondering if BFF supports local farmers markets throughout New York State. And if you don't, perhaps you can share other ways people that might not have land access to grow their own food could support some of your farmers and people that you support. Yeah, that's a great question. So for our organization, we really, um, we currently don't have any investments that are focused on um, food distribution, particularly with farmers markets. And so right now, you know, based off of kind of the need that we've gotten from the different expression of interest forms have been surrounding um, actual farmers. And so a lot of those farmers already um, are selling to farmers markets. And so that's kind of our way that we look to support um, farmers markets. But right now our focus is on um, supporting farmers. But as I said, we have other partners in the ecosystem that we're working with that are involved hands-on in distribution. And you know, we show up, we show up however we can to support those um, relationships. Is there anything else, Meller, Onika, you'd like to add to that? Okay. All right, so we are going to bring it to our last question for the webinar, um, which is basically just asking all of you how you think people on this webinar um, can help support your initiatives at Black Farmer Fund and beyond. Yeah, Onika, what you said at the beginning, if you eat your part of the food system, I think is is really critical. And I think something that would be important for, for folks on this webinar, since you know you all wear different hats, um, to really think through what your vision for an inclusive, equitable regional food system is. 
and think through what you can leverage at an individual level and an institutional level to get there. So, so for Black Farmer Fund, our vision is, you know, for Black, Brown, and Indigenous farmers being in relationship with the land, with each other, connected to food distributors, farmers markets, grocery stores, co-ops, restaurants, decentralized and collective decision making, strong networks that include these different actors along the supply chain, all thriving. And, and for us, we challenge you to think through, if you're a funder and an investor, what are the types of institutions you're supporting? What power dynamics are at play? Who has access to decision-making? Who leads these groups for larger institutional buyers and corporate actors and suppliers, recognizing that it's not a loving, level playing field and to reflect on what practices or, or policies that you currently have in place that might keep marginalized groups from participating um, ensuring that fair wages for time is worked, for just prices, for, for produce grown, and that you're offering non-extractive employment opportunities. All of, I'll pass it to you. To... Yeah, um, I would also say that on a policy level, how is um, civil society and communities that are directly impacted by these policies represented? and like also going beyond representation, actually directing the formulation and implementation of these policies. Um, and also, you know, how are we all building agency and collective action in our everyday decisions? As going back to Anika said, you know, everybody purchases food, right? Not only in the day-to-day -day decisions that you make, but also at the national and, and worldwide level. Um, in a way that's informed by, you know, some of the local realities that you face in your communities. And also most importantly, and particularly, you know, for our organization, other organizations that we work with, how are you, you know, listening and supporting BIPOC-led organizations um, that have these relationships with the agricultural communities that we serve? Um, and, you know, our organization is modeling an example of community interdependence and self-determination and, um, you know, so all those things that we mentioned, um, depending on where you kind of lie, are, are ways that you could, you know, reflect on your role and how you could participate. Um, and, you know, the best way, of course, is always going to our website, signing up to our newsletter, figuring out ways that you can either donate or participate um, for your money to be regranted um, or sent to our operational costs. Um, and just continuing to support, you know, this work because it is a long journey and it is a systemic change. So um, we, you know, know that this is not just um, BIPOC communities that will be responsible for this work. We, it's everybody's work that um, everyone needs to participate in as well. So, and I thank you so much. And I hate to put say anything else because I think that was such a beautiful closing by both of y'all. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that when we say that um, the, the power that consumers have is really great, um, and it, it is true, I just want to also make, make sure that we also understand that that is not, um, everyone doesn't have the same power. <laughs> Voting with your fork means that you have, you have the money, you know, to vote and make choices. And that's not the same for everyone. We don't all have equal power. I want to be really clear about that. So I, I don't want to make it sound like that is just enough. Your purchasing um, decisions are important um, and they are not in and of themselves enough because many of us do not have um, those same choices and can't make those choices. And so it's, it's imperative that all of us also do the advocacy um, so that we're trying to level this playing field and really give people true access um, to this bounty that's being created by, by black and brown farmers and farmers all over the, the country. So. I couldn't uh, leave without saying that. Um, and thank you all so much. Like I'm super excited to just be able to spend an hour um, with both of y'all. Thank you, Olive and Mel for asking me to join you. And thank you, Michelle, for um, giving Black Farmer Fund this opportunity. Yes, thank you so much. What a wonderful message to end on. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to check out Black Farmer Fund's website, blackfarmerfund.org to learn more about their work. Um, this webinar was recorded and we will be sending out a follow-up link email and we will also have it on our website. Um, again, thank you to our moderator and panelists, Onika, Olivia, and Melanie. And thank you everyone for joining and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>